where we're coming off of a lot of focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, especially coming coming off of the peak of the pandemic in the U.S., a lot of racial violence and reckoning around racism in the U.S., this lack of boundaries when it comes to where we can hire from and who we can put in what role. Um, but we're not seeing that increase in, in the equitable practices that we expect. It's so crucial to train employees and especially man managers on how to create that change, whether that's supporting their employees, whether that is recruiting different and, and more diverse employees, or whether that's just, you know, ro rolling out new new initiatives or a change, a change management strategy. Today's episode of the HR l and podcast is sponsored by Deal. Now take a moment, if you would, to consider the following pre-show scenario. Imagine you had to visit 16 houses just to cook your dinner. One place has the pots, another has the pans, another has the stove, and another has the food. You get the idea. Sounds ridiculous, right? Well, the reality is most global businesses operate exactly the same way, using 16 different tools and platforms to hire, manage, and pay their workforce. But now there's one platform that does it all, and that's today's sponsor. That's Deal. That's D-E-E-L. And Deal is the all-in-one platform built for global work. So whether you're an enterprise business, a small company, or something in between, from automated onboarding to performance assessments and beyond, you can manage the entire worker lifecycle all under one roof. Hire and onboard talent in over 150 countries or run payroll in over 100 countries even offer competitive benefits, equity, and equipment. With Deal's industry-leading suite of HR tools, payroll solutions, and compliance services, you can scale globally with unmatched speed and expertise. So are you ready to transform your global HR system? If you are, click in the link in the show notes to book a demo with Deal today. That's D-E-E-L. Welcome to the HR l &D podcast, where we explore cutting edge HR trends and best practices with top leaders who are shaping the future of work. Hello and welcome back to the HR l &D podcast. My name is Nick Day. I'm CEO at JGA Recruitment Group and we're specialist global HR recruiters. If you haven't subscribed to the show yet, please do so and please share it with all of your HR or people, colleagues and friends. Together, we can really raise the profile of human resources for everybody. And to help me achieve that today, I'm joined by two wonderful guests. Two for the price of one. We have Kelsey Pitlick and Rachel Bauer, who are the co-founders of the Guild Collective. Now, that's an organization dedicated to changing individual views and behaviors that shift workplace cultures and break down gender barriers, something I know many of you HR leaders are incredibly passionate about achieving within your own organizations. And soon, as you will discover, Kelsey it has a real internal drive to solve problems, whereas Rachel is often the first to point out if something is unfair or unequitable. So you're going to Find out a little bit more about their journey as we go through the show, but let's just say they're the perfect team to drive the work that they do. Kelsey's core as an empath combined with her technical expertise in conducting user research, designing usable interfaces, really allows her to develop powerful training experiences for her clients, which are really rooted in data, equity, and respect. Meanwhile, Rachel's background in student support for first-generation and non-traditional students, as well as designing diversity and inclusion curriculums, gives her a unique blend of skills, which are really necessary to support individuals in their journey to becoming allies and champions of inclusion efforts. I know that's something that my listeners want to be as well, and we're going to talk about how you can become a true champion during the course of this show. Now, both Rachel and Kelsey are mothers as well, who are incredibly passionate about elevating the invisible work that women do in the workplace and at home. They both work tirelessly to support their mission, which is to redefine the gender norms in their households in order to model an equitable work for their children. Now, today on the HR and podcast, Kelsey and Rachel are going to dive deep into their experiences to demonstrate exactly how HR professionals can create lasting, gender equity transformations within their businesses. So I cannot wait to get started. Welcome, Rachel. Welcome, Kelsey, to the HR LND podcast. Great to have you on the show. How are you both feeling today? I'm good. great. Thank you so much. What an amazing introduction. I'm going to hire you to come do our introductions everywhere we go. It was wonderful. Well, you're both <laughs> doing wonderful work, right? So there's a lot to get in there. And hopefully we've really got our HR listeners now fully engaged. We know this is something that they're really, really passionate about achieving. 
well, transformation within their businesses, right? Before we jump into that, let me just ask the first question, which I ask all of my guests. I'm going to perhaps ask you, Rachel, this question. Uh, what do the words human resources mean to you? To me, human resources is the practice and and the value that we place on the people within our workplaces. And when I think about that word resources, especially, um, and the way that we think about our people, I think for me, what human resources is, is thinking about our people as finite resources or resources that we, you know, they're, they're not renewable. We have to build into them. We have to preserve them. We have to respect them um, in order to keep them working and, and to keep them at their best selves. So for me, that practice of human resources is to think about them as sort of this, you know, precious thing that we have to, to protect and elevate in order to get all that we can out of the people that we work with and that work for us and that we work for. Fantastic. And let's be honest, those listening to this, we know they're all plate spinning, loads of different things, and therefore they need the support of professionals like yourselves to really help them get to grips with what is quite a a complex area at the minute that people want to get it right. But there are so many different people and companies trying to drive them in a particular direction. I'm going to start with, I guess, quite a hard hitting question for for you, Kelsey. And it's hard hitting in terms of helping our listeners rather than scaring either of you here, because on your website, the first thing that comes up when you go to the Guild Collective site, and there will be a URL to the site in the the show notes, it says front and centre that driving diversity, equity and inclusion change has never been harder. Why is this? Yes. So great question. So this is something that we have really heard from our past clients, from potential clients, from people that we've talked to in the human resources space, as well as those that are specifically dedicated to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And what we're hearing time and time again is that right now we're at a point of resistance to this change. We're at a point where we're coming off of a lot of focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, especially coming coming off of the peak of the pandemic in the U.S., um, a lot of um, racial violence and reckoning around um, racism in the U.S. And I think that there was so much emphasis on that for a period of time that there's been a little bit of a backlash. Um, I was listening to one of your your recent podcast episodes and they talked about the idea of diversity fatigue. And I think that that is very, very real and very present right now. And we get it. You know, it is very difficult to talk about these things. It's difficult to have that inward look and to recognize and understand the the biases that you carry with you and how those might be impacting your interactions within your organization, how they can impact the representation in your organization, how included people feel. It's it's difficult work and it's challenging work that can't be a one-off or check the box. And so when it comes to HR professionals or DEI professionals being able to really drive this work up against that resistance, it's hard to get budget. It's hard to get time on people's calendars. And then it's hard to actually embed the motivation into employees at all levels of the organization to really shift those behaviors. You said that in our in our introduction, but what does it take for somebody to actually take the tools and put them into practice? I think all of those things are so difficult because it's uncomfortable. Super. And for those that are listening in audio only, I've had Rachel nodding to that response. And I, I absolutely agree with that diversity fatigue piece, right? I've been doing these podcasts since 2018, and it's something we've been talking about a lot. And yet still, there's a real challenge for HR departments to, to really get this embedded as the word that you used. So if gender equity remains a significant topic in the workplace and something that we should all be trying to improve, why is the challenge still persisting? Why is it still so difficult to get it through? You mentioned there that you know budgets may not be there. Well, then why is there not the budget? Is, is there a lack of buy-in at C-suite level? Uh, maybe you'll know more, Rachel. I wonder if you could uh, help me understand. 
Yeah, I think that, I mean, this going back to the the fatigue that we've talked about so far, I mean, I think that it is still such an issue because, well, there's a few different reasons, right? So we've seen sort of the ebb and flow. And so right now we're in, if we think about that as like a peak in a valley, we're in the valley, right? Of, um, you know, we have had these, you know, really big, really um, expensive, really um, public efforts when it comes to DE&I and, and gender equity work. And um, and we've seen a lot of those flop. And I think a lot of that goes back to, um, you know, the the lack of measurement, the lack of intention, the lack of accountability that companies and or organizations placed on themselves when they started out this work. You know, so so many things that we've noticed um, and that we've experienced, and that I'm sure you'll agree with in any sort of DE and I work, um, are are reactionary. They are a result of something that's happened. Um, you know, in in the U.S., we saw a huge, huge influx of, I guess I'll call it an, an influx of passion, an increase of empathy, um, as a result to some very public, very, um, very impactful things that happened. Um, you know, that impacted mar- marginalized communities in and outside of the workplace. Obviously, COVID was one of those, and that impacted working women and working moms in such a such a big way. But um, you know, we saw companies react to to that, and maybe without the most intention, everyone was just reacting during that time. Um, and so, what resulted in that was, you know, pullback and uh, budget constraints and the valley that that we're in now. I think that that's a big piece of it. I think the other piece of it is, you know, I was reading um, the other day, just you know, sort of re-upping my my knowledge of like the 2022 global gender gap report from the World Economic Forum. And I believe that their number, and I'm I'm not going to quote it exactly, but I think I think I'm right. I think they said that at the rate we're going, we're 132 years away from reaching gender parity. Yeah. So anyone looks at that number and they think, okay, well, we can't solve that. Um, and we've already experienced sort of this pen- pendulum effect and people are just in a place where they're just, you know, kind of back to um, like spinning their wheels and working as hard as they can and doing as much as they can. And um, I think that what really we've discovered in our work, what we have learned through through research, what we have seen, what we've experienced ourselves firsthand um, is the real issue there kind of goes to that core of what I said about that pendulum, which is we can't be reactionary when it comes to this type of work. We have to be intentional and we have to have that drive to actually create transformative change. If we don't start from a place of A, measuring and understanding what is creating that gap if just thinking first about your or- organization maybe even just your small team if you're an hr practitioner um you know what can i do on a micro level that can have a ripple effect and and create change throughout the or- organization we don't have to think about solving the 132 year gender equity um you know path that that we're on starting with thinking about you know what is it that's going to actually create lasting mo- motivation and lasting change um that's never going to be a knee-jerk reaction to a world event or to a public event. That's going to be looking at your own data, understanding the perceptions and experience that your own employees are having, what is draining them of those finite resources, the gifts that they can give, um, and then sharing that, dispelling that with throughout the or- organization to leadership, to the people that can create the the pathways for, for this equity work to take place in a way that sparks empathy that's going to last because it's about the everyday human experience, the everyday experience that your employees are having and how we can create, you know, small and lasting changes that improve that. So I know it's a big answer to what is really a big question. You know, I think the, the, the long and short of it really comes down to, it's still an issue because I think that we've lacked sort of the, the, the key or the the unlocking of what's really at the core of it, which it's a human experience. It's a human problem. And um, yes, we can talk all day long about the business case for improving your, your gender equity and closing some of those gaps for underrepresented employees. But at the end of the day, it's, it's a human issue and we have to kind of go to the emotion and the empathy that's needed to drive it and to continue it. There's one thing that, that comes to mind uh, when you gave that response. Maybe this is my recruitment hat working, okay? So something just popped into my head that you would, I would have thought, as a podcast host of this show, but also as a CEO of a recruitment business, right? 
But you mentioned the pandemic as being one of those catalysts for for change and for awareness and, and things like that. You would have thought now in the world we live in, which I would argue is more borderless than it's ever been before with remote working, with technology. Um, I know you both coach on leadership as well. So in, from a leadership context, we've moved our leadership model now much more to an output led model, you know, without the, the idea of micromanagement. Here's your task. I don't really mind when it gets done. It needs to be done. You know, and you, you measure on outputs. But actually, that should Cut, overcome many of the challenges I would argue that maybe work, you know, working mums may have about returning into the office because people don't have offices now but actually it's not it's not limited to gender this is you know whether you are dis, dis, uh, disabled or whether you're a person of color whether you're from a different uh, geographical location if we focus on the skills and the output led sort of style of management that actually this is the task this is how we get it done it should in theory enable a truly diverse workforce to be able to take those opportunities. And yet, as a recruiter, I haven't really seen that happen. We're still having the same conversations about these major imbalances uh, across the DEI spectrum. Um, and I just kind of wondered why that why that is. Why do you think that recruiters, talent professionals, or, or C-suite or, or companies generally really haven't taken the mantle and gone, you know what, now we can change our entire recruitment process to be more inclusive because actually we want the skills to do this and we want to find a person who can deliver and that's it. I guess my very quick and easy answer to that is bias. Um, So we all still carry biases that have been rooted in us and reinforced time and time again for our entire lives. So our biases didn't completely change or or rework themselves as a result of the changes that came from, from the pandemic. So yes, in theory, it would be great to say we are totally focused on output and our organizations might outwardly state that, but what are our biases doing in the background? What are those unconscious biases telling us in the background if one person is maybe in a hybrid work environment, one person's coming into the office four days a week or five days a week, and one is coming in one or two days a week. There's still a, I guess, a perception that maybe somebody that is working from home is not able to be as productive or you kind of filling in the gaps and making assumptions about what somebody is doing with their time, regardless of whether or not those productivity outcomes are the same. So I think that that's still still a big challenge in terms of rewiring some of those biases and the need to take a step back and check some of our assumptions along the way, because those are very embedded in us and we need to constantly be asking ourselves, okay, why might the opposite of of what I think be true. We talk a lot about, there's great work by um, Daniel Kahneman in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, and kind of talks about these two systems of the brain. One is that sort of reactionary or biased side of the brain. I'm really simplifying this. But the other is that more rational side of the brain. And how can we put that rational part of the brain, that system two, in a place to be catching our system one in the times when our biases are taking control of our interactions or taking control of our decisions, especially in things like recruiting? How can we make that more objective so that we can make those more rational decisions that would get to the outcomes that you're talking about? We should be there. We should be having these outcomes. So those are some kind yeah, of tools or things that you can think about. I mean, that was just my recruitment head firing mm-hmm. and all of a I was just thinking about as Rachel was talking there. I think there's a, the solution sometimes is in front of us and we can't quite see it. And it's a shame to see so many reports of people saying, no, we need people back in the office. I would I would go back to uh, my, an episode I did over a year ago with Stephen Covey, all about trust and inspire. If we trust our workforce, they'll be inspired to do the work. And I think a lot of this coming back to the office, as you say, is that lack of trust that are they doing as, as efficiently as they could do if I had been able to look at them every single day? I don't know. Bigger question. I'm aware it's probably a rabbit hole on a podcast on its own entity. So I want to bring it back on point. It was me that took it away. So apologies for that. But Rachel, <laughs> um, what strategies would you recommend then for HR leaders listening to this who really want to bridge the gap between their intentions and effective action when it comes to really promoting gender equity initiatives? Yeah, well, I don't think you took us off because I 
can tie this answer directly to what you just said, right? So, so often we, again, have these solutions. We have the ideas of what we think is going to to work, right? Exactly what you were describing. You know, we have this this lack of boundaries when it comes to where we can hire from and who we can put in what role, um, but we're not seeing that increase in, in the equitable practices that we expect. So often we have this... Um, we have this great implementation that we want to roll out, or we have these great intentions of creating inclusive workforces. And we we might share those intentions with our, our managers. You know, there's sort of that mid-level of managers who I think of as sort of these work horses of our organization. They are coaching and bringing in our entry-level workforce. They are, you know, kind of being the face of the company culture to all of the people that that report up to them or, um, and then also kind of translating the needs and wants of those employees up to the leaders that they they, they report to, right? Obviously, I'm oversimplifying a company sure. structure, but, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about the, those people, if we're thinking about like a five tier or, or organizations, the ones that sit around tier three or even two or four, you know? Um, So often we sort of task them with whatever this rollout is going to be with whatever um, the changes that we want to see. And then we just leave it there. We don't educate them. We don't spark the the motivation or the buy-in that they need to actually create change. So tying back to the recruitment question, you know, we've, we've kind of told our, our managers, our hiring managers, you know, oh yeah, we're going to kind of focus on creating a diverse workforce. Have fun with that. Right. So it's so crucial to train employees and especially managers on how to create that change, whether that's supporting their employees, um, whether that is recruiting different and and more diverse employees um, or whether that's just, you know, rolling out new new initiatives or a change change management strategy. We're expecting more from our managers than ever before, both from the the employees that that report up to them and from the the leadership. So I think when it comes to bridging that gap um, between intention and action, it's not just about um, communicating what we need to communicate to our management teams, whether that's within HR um, or from HR to our management teams, but it's actually about giving them the training and the support and the knowledge of how to implement those tools um, and how they can be effective. So, you know, training them on how to have the inclusive discussions and how to interrupt the microaggressions that either they're witnessing or perpetuating, right? Giving them the actual knowledge, being very intentional with, you know, when we're thinking about driving that transformative change, I always want to tie it back to measurement, right? So if we are training them and providing them insight on how to be proactive and support career development, deliver equity um, when it comes to performance evaluations and career progression, um, you know, measure them on the success of the the rollout that that you're sending their their way, right? Don't just teach them, but tell them how are we going to measure it, the, the success that you have, and how is that going to be tied back to your performance as a, a manager or as a professional, right? You know, teaching them how to recognize where um, where their employees are when it comes to well-being, how to help them ma- manage their burnout, you know, so not just expect this of them, but actually train them, right? All of that said, those trainings are great. They're essential, but we can't get to the action place, that lasting and transformative action that's going to create change, especially with issues like equity, whether that's gender equity, racial equity, any any equity for a marginalized group. We can't get there if we skip that crucial step of driving the empathy that's going to motivate them um, beyond measurement and their performance evaluations. But that empathy that is going to motivate them to actually interrupt their biases and to be fully bought in to creating that more equitable workplace, right? Because we expect so much of our managers and our mid-level, we expect so much of them, especially when it comes to those finite resources, those precious and 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 very val- valuable resources that I talked about at the beginning, um, our people, we expect so much of them. Um, I think oftentimes they just kind of file it like, okay, this is another thing that I'm supposed to be doing. Um, but really it's it's up to us as practitioners to kind of create that light bulb moment, that aha, aha moment, and to create situations where, you know, they can feel, they can actually feel and experience to the best of their ability. You know, what does it actually feel like to be working in this or- organization as an entry-level 
you know, person of color who doesn't see anyone like me, um, or maybe only sees one of 10 people like me in, in, in the leadership suite, or, you know, that's just one, one example, but, you know, we often kind of, you know, sitting in conferences, we've been doing this work for so long or talking with clients, we kind of hear from the older generation saying, oh, I didn't realize that, you know, there were so many inequities or they usually don't use that language, but I didn't realize that, you know, gender bias was still an issue until my daughter entered the workforce a couple of years ago. And then I, I learned that, you know, she was experiencing X, Y, and Z when she had her first child, there wasn't appropriate places for her to pump or places for her to, you know, or there wasn't a good practice in place for if her child was sick, she didn't have a backup care system. Um, you know, and and they, that empathy is sparked, right? The change and the motivation and the drive to continue that that change is is created. So, um, you know, creating the the tools to train and measure, but then also kind of taking it a step further and making sure that you're creating that empathy and the motivation for them to be open and receptive and just fully bought into this work, I think is really the way to kind of create a direct route from intention to action because they're going to believe in it. They're going to be bought it into it and they're going to be able to practice it because they care about that. Hello, HR and people leaders. Are you exhausted of the war for talent cliche? The problem is when we hear a cliche, it usually exists for a reason. However, we think it's time for a fresh approach to the talent crisis. That's because at JGA Recruitment, we understand the real challenges you face in sourcing phenomenal HR and people candidates. And guess what? We think we have the solution. Our team is on a mission to revolutionize your hiring process. That's because we're not just recruiters. We're strategic partners dedicated to finding HR and people professionals who align perfectly with your company's vision and goals. So let's break the cycle of frustration together. Partner your talent acquisition strategies with JGA Recruitment and experience the difference in service, excellent and results. No longer do you need to suffer the costs associated with a poor hire, because with over 100 five-star Google reviews and already trusted by many of the world's leading brands, why don't you take action today? Contact us at jgarecruitment.com to discover how we can help transform your HR and people teams. And here's a bonus. When you visit us, you can sign up for our weekly HR newsletter that's packed with invaluable industry insights and more. Let's revolutionize your HR talent acquisition strategies together and make the war for talent a cry from the past. Visit jjrecruitment.com to find out more. Yeah, no, it's a great response. I love the idea as well, but you know, you mentioned earlier that often somebody wants to make a change. I mean, it's passion drives action. I mean, it's brought, brought you two together and you're creating great um, a number of resources and work and work in business to make things better. But if you haven't got that passion, action is really difficult. And often it's the HR leaders that listen to this who are the, often really passionate about making change. And they'll go to their senior C-suite or their managers and say, I want to do this. And it's not that they get they say no. It's that, yes, if you want to lead it, go do it. But that's not a manager that's really bought into the change. What I loved at the end of that response was you were talking about an, a potential situation where someone's daughter goes in and realizes there's a problem. At that point, the empathetic response is, you know, I, I see where the problems are. But of course, that's a reactionary change in those individuals. What you want to do is make a proactive change. So there is never anything back to report back on because it's already in place. And for that, we need that to, as we know, to a whole business to be bought in to making sure that this is a, a an approach to business rather than a reaction to something we need to do. I think one of you mentioned uh, checkbox exercises earlier, and that's not really an effective process, I'm sure. So with that in mind, and just taking Rachel's response on a little bit further, uh, Kelsey, if we may, what are then yeah. for HR professionals, what are the sort of key obstacles that they're encountering when they want to make lasting gender, gender equity transformations within their organizations? Uh, I understand some of it um, Rachel's covered, and I understand that one of the ways of overcoming those obstacles might be measuring and showing the efficiencies and the improvements and, and the benefits of having a diverse workforce and all the things that come with it. What are the obstacles that they're encountering in the first place? So I think we touched on a little bit of this earlier with that idea of it being really difficult to see, recognize, and be open to looking at your organization and finding those places where inequities might exist, where bias might be driving those things. You know, as we are kind of moving back into what what I I hate to call but but we'll use the phrase new normal as we're moving back into this new normal I think that a lot of people just want to go back to the way things were even if they didn't like them 
it was the known, it was the comfortable, um, and that ambiguity of what is in the future can can be a little bit scary. So I think that there's definitely that that resistance piece that we're still seeing. And then that idea of checking the box, whether that is for a specific initiative or an overall, okay, we recognize that other organizations are doing X, Y, and Z, and we want to make sure that we're keeping up with them. So yes, we're going to implement this policy, but there's not that true buy-in. Um, you know, if leaders aren't on board and ready to deal with the resistance, they might need more data on how their employees are feeling. They might need more data on attrition rates, really understanding what others are doing in their space and how it's working for them, how those competitors might be outperforming them. There's a lot of research that shows that more diverse companies outperform those from a bottom line perspective, because for a lot of different reasons, but decision making is improved, innovation is improved um, by having a more diverse workforce. So a lot of reasons why there's so much benefit to it. So you can kind of take those different logical reasons, but then again, getting to the heart of it and focusing on that empathy and motivation. So one way that that we have kind of taken that idea of, okay, my daughter entered the workforce and now I understand is, and being able to have that light bulb moment for more individuals is through the creation of a gender inequity simulator. Because to be quite frank, we can't wait for everybody to have a daughter enter the workforce. So how can we get that buy-in? How can we get that true empathy and motivation through an experience where you can kind of walk in the shoes of another person and feel what they might be feeling. And, and as we've rolled out this, the simulator, we've had people say, oh my gosh, I got so mad. I got so frustrated during this experience because maybe it's somebody that has been in a position of more privilege and they have they're taking on the persona of a more underrepresented individual and seeing those things from a different perspective they're actually feeling the feelings and can then use that as that driver as that motivation to implement those tools which we all know are out there. We have tools to interrupt our biases. We have tools to act as an advocate or, or an ally. But without that drive, or without that motivation behind it, they, they tend to fall flat. And so that can really work at the leadership level to gain that buy-in. It can work at that mid-level manager level, as Rachel was talking about, to really train and drive the implementation of some of these things for those really critical mid-level managers and for individual contributors who are impacting one another's experiences as well to be really aware and be able to make those more cultural changes uh, within the organization as well. And Sue, I just want to bring something to life for listeners in case you hadn't quite caught it. So <laughs> you've offered something on your website. There'll be a link in the show notes to something which is super innovative, super clever, and it's you've titled it the Gender in Inequity Simulator. So you can access this on your website. There'll be a link to that in the show notes, which will bring everything that Kels just mentioned to life. You can go and experience this yourself and find out what it feels like. So uh, this wasn't just a term that people should necessarily be familiar with in the workplace. It's something you guys have created that is fantastic, right? It's something that really people can help experience it from a different viewpoint. It's really, really clever. Something that I wanted to mention as well, because again, recruitment hat is, 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 is firing here for a moment, is we can also use some of the data, and we've talked about how important data is to you know to to understand where there may be biases present in our business or inequalities or things that aren't working. Because from my perspective, you can spot those through your talent attraction and retention statistics. And I'm sure there are many other measurement tools you can use as well. But for me, much easier to sell a business that is very open minded, uh, particularly when we talk about a younger workforce. Some of the things they're looking for now, and 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 actually, it can be really crucial in their decision making process. Is they want to feel that, like they really are included and that they belong in the businesses they go to. The values are really really important. And if a company is losing staff, often it's because some of those things aren't working for that organization in that moment. Just wondered uh, for myself, Rachel, if I'm an HR professional that wants to build a really effective 
case study, perhaps, to my senior leadership team. And I want to get their buy-in to really help drive and maintain my transformation efforts. Are there any particular kind of measurements or tools or, or things beyond talent attraction and retention that maybe they can start looking at that can help them build their case study? So I love this question because so often um, I would say if I could like do, if, if I had a magic wand, if I could do one thing to sort of change the mindset of any company that that we're working with or just sort of across the globe when it comes to this sort of work, it's to root whatever it is um, in data. So, so often I would say like the number one problem that, that happens when clients come to us is they come to... I, us with, with an idea of what their company needs. Um, if you're not watching this, I'm using quotes here when I say needs, <laughs> right? Um, whether that's for female identifying employees or otherwise, right? So um, they they so often have an idea, oh, this is the problem. You know, we've had clients come to us before and say, oh, we have this huge gap in our employee engagement data. So they are root- rooting that in data between how, you know, men um, and women identifying employees are, um, are, you know, just their level of engagement. So we know that there's a gender equity issue and here's what we want you to do to solve it. Right. So they come to us, but what they haven't done yet is that work of understanding what their employees are missing, whether that's in their professional lives, what they're struggling with, um, what are the daily perceptions and interactions that they're having that are you know, impacting those numbers if they even have those numbers um, to 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 begin with. So they're not really asking the right question, which is not what do we need to do. It's first asking, you know, what that problem is. So you you can look at things like recruitment data and you can see where there's a gap, right? You you can look at at things like retention data and see, oh, um, I am losing more more women than I am men when it comes to employees, or I'm I'm not able to retain or recruit people of color, right? Right? So you can see, you know, what we need to change is we want to increase this. We know that there's benefits to diversity, equity, and inclusion within our companies. Uh, we want to be in that highest sector of profitability and, and efficiency and effectiveness. So we're going to change this. But you haven't asked, again, that question of why. So when it comes to, um, you know, looking at, at data or what you can can collect, I really think it's it's doing that work and maybe some pr- practitioners aren't going to be that excited about this answer because sometimes that work is more intensive and extensive than, you know, an, an employee engagement survey, although many employee engagement surveys are done very well. Um, it's looking at, um, you know, what are the different factors that impact the work that you are doing each and every day. So kind of me- measuring and Maybe this is with a survey, but you know it can also be really helpful too if you especially have a third party to help because it can be difficult for employees to open up internally about this. But it can yeah. also look like focus groups. It can look like interviews. Um, but you know, being really, really intentional about asking, um, you know, about many different layers of of what is impacting the employee experience. So that's team, that's expectations, that's output, that's measurement. That's environment if you are in a physical working environment or also if you are working remotely. So it's really being intentional and asking not necessarily the what questions, but the why questions. And I think, again, it could be an entire podcast on how to design surveys um, so that you're able to kind of get out that, that information that you want. But a lot of times for us, we're given, you know, a set of, of or a, like a data set, a set of numbers that shows us what employees are at risk. Oftentimes you can really identify that. And then we want to do the work of, okay, but why are they at risk? Like what is actually creating this? And then I think you didn't ask this, but I'm going to add this because <laughs> what I think the other magic wand that I wish I could wave for our clients and companies across the globe is I think the other thing that we miss is remembering again thinking about those precious resources the people that that work for us is that you know these are really smart really capable people that we've hired to do you know jobs that we find to be very important no matter what level no matter what their status is communicate with them about the findings that you have 
communicate with them about why you're collecting the data in a different way than you've done pre pre previously communicate with them and tell them we've seen this gap or we recognize that there's a need but we don't want to just fill it with whatever we can do quickest we want to actually know why this exists and then we're going to be really communicative with you throughout the process of rolling out initiatives we'll be honest with you about the measurements that we're doing to see if those are going to be successful but Quite frankly, it's it, it's a longer game, but I I really believe that if we communicate with our employees about the how and why, um, then any data collection that we do, any initiative that we want to roll out is going to be more successful. We only worry so often about making the case to leadership about why we need budget for something. Um, but employees deserve to know that too. I, that might just be one person's opinion, but so often we talk to employees or individual contributors when we're, when we're in trainings who their leadership has no idea, but they're completely disgruntled because all of this work is being done behind the scenes. They recognize something's up, right? Like we all can tell if like all of a sudden we're changing and measuring all of these different things, but no one has told, told them, why? Um, so we're yeah. always worried about creating survey fatigue and asking them too many questions and taking away from their desks to get to that why. But if you just tell them and you show them what changes that you're going to make and that it's going to improve their their work life, I really believe that most employees will buy buy in and they'll be excited because they want to see the action that's going to come from it. Yeah, no, listen, it's great advice. I, I love the fact you mentioned this. A long, it's a long you know, there's no short solution, I think, is the word you use. I think we've established that. I've been doing these podcasts since 2018 about DEI, and it starts with checkbox exercises. That might be a short-term fix. It doesn't really solve the problem. And, you know, Simon Sinek has done a lot of work about the why. We know that if we find our why for anything, it gives us more purpose and more meaning to what we're trying to achieve. And I think that speaks volumes to kind of the work that you, both of you, are, are, are really pushing for and, and, and promoting and, and helping organizations to achieve better equity because it's so important. And if people understand the reasons why and the benefits that come with it, hopefully more will follow. And I think the understanding that it's a long game to get it right isn't a bad thing, as you say, if the why is clearly communicated. And I can see exactly in the way you put it there, why there are some potential obstacles in the way for, for that achieving. So let's assume we get the buy-in from the stakeholders. I think the really important thing I'd like to ask now to you, Kelsey, is I've got the case study, the C-suite have gone, yeah, I get it. This is fantastic. Let's 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 bring about real change, real transformation. What can HR leaders do to ensure that the programs that they bring about actually do deliver genuine transformation that lasts, that maintains? Yes. So I think we've we've definitely talked about that empathy piece. I think that's where you need to start driving that empathy, driving that motivation in a variety of different ways, helping people to understand, as we just talked about, understand the why behind it. Why do we want to create a more diverse and inclusive workplace? How is that going to benefit you? How is it going to benefit your team and the organization so that people understand the relevance for them? developing that empathy so that they can be motivated to support themselves or another person, and then giving them the tools to do that. So there's, um, when you think about unconscious bias and kind of the, the debate that has waged on around unconscious bias training, a lot of the time what you hear is that I guess for the naysayers of, of that type of training is that it can actually bring up these biases and it can kind of cause some of this resistance within the organization or can highlight those biases and make them stronger. If you dig deeper into that research, what it shows is that that applies if you don't give the tools of what to do about it. So when you are at that point of, okay, I understand what it is. I understand how it's going to help me. I understand why I want to do this. Now, what do we do about it? It's really about understanding those tools for an individual. What can I do to interrupt my own biases? We talked about that idea of being more aware of when our biases may be in the driving driver's seat, asking ourselves that question of why might the opposite of what I think be true? How can I kind of check myself or push my push back on those assumptions I might be making? How can I look outside myself to recognize where another person might be impacted by biases and use my own privilege to support them? And then from there, also looking more broadly at the organization and the systems within those the organization 
that allow for biases to creep in? What are those things that we can put into place, those objective structures that we can put into place so biases don't have the opportunity to take control? I think a great example of this is for you in, in the recruiting space, and you t- you were talking about different metrics as well, but a really easy thing to look at is, okay, once I have a pool of candidates for a particular position, even just starting and looking at that pool of candidates and saying, do we have representation within this pool of candidates? Because if one group is significantly more represented than another, and that can be across any diversity dimension, you're more likely to bring up biases that are associated with the underrepresented. So there's there's um, these crazy, crazy numbers, and I and I hope that I get them right, uh, but I could definitely share share the source of this. But what it shows is that when you have um, at least two female candidates in a pool of a pool of candidates, a woman is seventy nine times more likely to be hired than if there was just one female candidate. So there's a really wow. significant benefit to having diversity in that pool of candidates. So that's just one small example of something that you can do within your systems to ensure that you're getting the best, most qualified candidate for for the role. And the the resource that that comes from and a lot of really great tools is called biasinterrupters.org. So I definitely encourage people to check that out from a systemic bias interruption perspective. Yeah, no, it's really interesting. Something that popped into my head here, and I don't know, maybe hopefully maybe you'll have a solution to this, uh, but as a recruiter, I'm thinking now, I've got these, these, these CVs maybe I'm reviewing, but also I know you're both really passionate about not just you know improving and breaking down barriers and, and, and uh, biases in relation to gender, gender inequity, but also really supporting working mums and helping, you know, we know that, uh, I'm, I have a, a wife who's a working mom. I've got my mom who's got, I've got some experience, but it's from a, a male's point of view, right? So I can only get so much. But we know there's a lot of, uh, res- a lot of working moms feel restricted, both in the type of work they can potentially apply for. And they also feel that, that if they were to disclose that they're a working mom, it may restrict their opportunities for progression as well. So this is something that it can be really difficult to understand or even uh, know about, particularly from the perspective of a recruiter where you see a resume that says they're, they may be uh, female, but we don't know if they're a working mum or not. But actually, we want to be championing uh, the, the ability to do the job, right? The ability to find the best candidate, which is the most important thing, whether that's working mum or not. But what can we do in your experience to really champion the inclusivity and the representation of working mums in the workforce? What I would say is without needing to know if a specific candidate is a working mom, a working parent or not, if your organization is set up in a way that has flexibility, has support for working parents, it's going to benefit everyone. So that creating that type of supportive workplace environment, even if you're designing it with working moms in mind, Ultimately, everyone is going to find value from that. And you can use that as a tool in your recruiting practices to say, here are the things that we have in place that are available to everyone. That also then allows people who are not working parents to feel like, okay, I am, I'm also allowed to have a life outside of this job as well. There's, there's sort of um, a fine line to walk in terms of saying these are benefits only for parents that then disadvantage individuals that don't have children as well. So if it's a great place to work for everyone, that's going to help with that recruitment across the board. And it's going to help those working mothers, working parents to recognize that this is an organization that champions them. And then when it comes to that, that interviewing phase or that period of time where you're debating on who the best candidate is, it doesn't even need to be a factor of is this person going to need more support or not because everybody is getting that support. I love that because it's no, it's not a band aid response. It's actually solved at its source, off it to begin with, right? And then it doesn't become an issue in itself. That's about the proactive approach that Rachel was talking about earlier. Anything you wanted to add to that, Rachel? No, I think that that was great. I mean, I agree with all all of it. As Kelsey said, we get very excited about this. I think as a working mom, the important thing to remember. Um, 
you know, as, as recruiters or as businesses is it's very easy for us, especially if we've, you know, had children for, you know, a number of years, but even for first time moms, because the, um, I mean, I would say just like this, this issue of, of creating pathways for success and the workplace for working moms is only getting bigger and stronger. There's a real snowball effect here, which like, thank goodness, um, we can really see through those band-aid efforts. I would say in, in an interview process, um, you know, always, of course, the interview process is an opportunity for a company to sell itself, right? And, and to sell the flexibility and to sell the culture. Um, but it is very easy to sort of step on your own toes and and to out yourself as, as a company that, um, you know, by, by sharing a practice that we can kind of see through and see, oh, that's not very equitable. So if you're, you know, in an interview process and, and you hear from a potential employer, yeah, we're really flexible. You know, if, if you start working at 7.30, then you can finish at 4.30. If, if, if you have to drop kids off, you know, if, if you have children, you know, maybe you don't start working until nine and you can work until six. Well, for a working parent, not just a mom, the, the, the alarm bells are going off because you're thinking, well, I can never get in before X time and I have to leave by X time, or I have to finish by X time because I have children. And I have to, to do this. And so the wheels start turning and it's, um, you know, what, what one company might define as flexibility. Um, you know, if that, if that notion is still tied back to like something antiquated, like counting the amount of hours that someone's in seats, well, an, an employee is going to recognize right away. Um, yeah. maybe, Maybe pre-pandemic, we would have looked at that and said, okay, that's that's flexibility. Sure. But that is no longer, right? And so I would just encourage any company um, to really, you know, again, go back, ask those questions, get get ex- get insight into your employee experience of, you know, do they actually feel val- valued and supported as companies that can't or, or as as employees that can make their own decisions about their their schedule and and create the outputs that they need. Yeah, no, fantastic. Actually, it brought back a memory for me. I had a, a member of staff of our team, really got a small business, uh, and she had never seen her child um, in sports day because the previous employer wouldn't allow it. And she joined our firm. So this wasn't something that we placed. It's something that joined us. And I, I always think there's something that I would never want to miss. So as a business owner, I was like, well, I want to make my own my kid's sports day, right? So absolutely, you could make yours. Eh? That would be double standards. And B, what a wonderful thing to be able to do. And I remember uh, an emotional picture being sent when she'd made the first sports day and she'd never seen in, in a number of years. And it was like, those things should be made available because actually it's not just about the experience for the parent. And you know, this isn't gender specific, this is a parental thing here. This is about... If you look after your employees, they give it back in spades anyway, through commitment, through productivity, yes. through uh, dedication, and all those things that come with just being a good employer. So I think there's loads of lessons that can be learned. And it's wonderful having two um, hugely passionate individuals on the show today talking about how we can try and improve the efforts to improve uh, gender equity or inequity rather in the workplace. So um, is there any other questions I haven't asked that are really passionate for either of you that you'd like to raise the awareness for before we... Before we sort of start to close the show, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions in the HR L&D vault before we do. I want to make sure that we don't leave anything unasked here because this is a really important subject. Uh, the only thing I would say is, you know, we've we've covered a lot of ground. And if somebody is out there and questioning where where do I begin or where do I go from here? Maybe you're at a check the box state right now, but where to go from here uh, we hear that all the time from from clients, potential clients, just people in the industry. So what I would suggest is if you visit our website, it's guildcollective.com. That's G-I-L-D collective.com slash start. We've put together a great resource. It's just a quick, honestly, probably about two minute assessment. You answer a couple questions about your organization and it gives you a little bit of direction on creating your own equity plan within your organization to say, here's a great place to start. And here's a great next step of where you can go next. So I know it's always hard to kind of say, okay, you've given me so many ideas, but what to do next. So that guildcollective.com slash start is a great place to begin. 
Fantastic. And I'll make sure that link is available in the show notes. If you're interested, go straight through to the show notes of this episode and you can find that link immediately. And it kind of links back to that plate spinning earlier. There are some fantastic resources that makes your jobs easier of HR professionals if you go and find know where to find them. So that's a great one to start. So we're going to open the HR Lindy Vault. I'm going to ask, uh, actually, we're going to start with you, Rachel. So you get two questions. Uh, actually, I'll ask you both the last question. I'll start with you, though, Rachel. If you can give one piece of advice to the world, what would it be? Oh, my goodness. One piece of advice to the world. I would say, remember that everyone's perception is their reality. Remember that every person that you meet has had their own experiences. They view the world in their own specific way based on the things that they've experienced. And therefore, the way that they're perceiving the world is their reality. And it's not our job to judge that. It's our job to meet them where they are, even when we disagree, even when we are, you know, maybe at at, at odds and, and it feels moral and it feels like there's a judgment It doesn't matter because their reality is theirs. My my reality is mine. How can we look at who they are as a person and and meet them in a place that allows us to to have discussion and to have um, a common ground? So I really, that's something I I try to live by every day. Their perception is their, their reality. I learned that in student support. That was something that I was taught in my master's program, and I carried it with me through all all the work that I've done, even in parenting small, tyrannical toddlers. <laughs> they, what they perceive is very real. Love that response. I'm a huge someone who's hugely passionate about the inside out um, thinking method. Michael Neal and his kind of coaching philosophies. Yeah, it starts from what we experience is the way that we see the world. So. Uh, love that response. Uh, yeah, fantastic. Yes. And coming to you, uh, Kelsey, if you had the opportunity, what advice would you give to a younger you just starting out in this new world of work? I think that's something I continue to be surprised by in my life is how the pieces tend to fit together later on, even when I didn't recognize how they might fit together when I was younger. So with that being said, I think the advice I would give is try the different things, go after different experiences, learn different things, even if they don't always feel related, even if they don't always feel relevant, the pieces of your life are going to ultimately kind of click together in different ways that you could have not seen coming. And so not holding yourself back from from something that maybe doesn't make sense on paper because it will all kind of come together in the end. Fantastic. And last but no means least, and you may agree on the answer here, potentially, because I've heard a certain word come up a few times in the show, but I don't want to lead you. And what is the guiding principle behavior you've seen in every great leader that you've worked with? I'll start with you, Rachel. Empathy. It's empathy. having that empathy for the human experience to always remember the the human in your human resources. These are real people. They are experiencing very real things. And again, their perception is their reality. Um, these are the faces of, of, of your company. So having very, very empathetic and intentional, att- intentionally empathetic views on what they're going through, whether or not, again, you think that they should toughen up or whether you agree with them or not, always try to remember that they are walking in their own shoes and and the best leaders, in my opinion, the best leaders I've had on an anecdotal basis as, as a human resource myself are the ones that take a second to step into my shoes and see how I might be experiencing things. Fantastic. And Kelsey? I would agree. I have to go with empathy as well. And I think just recognizing, you know, it goes back to that idea of everybody has something, everybody's going through something, everybody has a different worldview and a different perspective and being able to understand what they need and being able to meet that need in unique ways is so valuable. So I would go with empathy as well. Well, I want to be empathetic to your commitments. I'm conscious of time. So I'm going to uh, say a huge thank you to both of you for joining me on the, today on the HL and podcast. Of course, for those listening and want to find out more about the Guild Collective, Kelsey's already given you the domain there. It's www.gild, that's guildcollective.com. There will be a link in the show notes to the website, to the start um, survey that uh, Kelsey mentioned, and also to the fantastic uh, gender equity simulator for those who want to find out more. There's also a host of other resources, links to McKinsey studies and more. So if you're really interested in this subject, do check out the website. Whether or not you're engaging with the Guild Collective, I guarantee there'll be something on there that you'll find useful and beneficial to the case studies that I hope you as HR leaders will now be creating to deliver to your C-suites to get that budget that you need to make real transformation happen. Now, of course, on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn as well. So those links will also be in the show notes. And of course, if you are an HR professional listening to this show, 
and you need support with talent or recruitment, that's where we come in. Please do reach out to myself or my wonderful team at jgarecruitment.com. Just leaves me to say a huge thank you once more to Rachel Bauer and to Kelsey Pitlick for joining me today on the HR Only podcast. I've enjoyed every minute. Genuinely, what a, such an important topic. Thank you for bringing it to life. And I hope it's helped our listeners out there. So thank you ever so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Today's episode of the HR L&D podcast is sponsored by Deal, the all-in-one global people platform that simplifies how you manage the entire global team lifecycle. From contractors, direct employees, EOR, and more, you can manage them all in one place with Deal. Hire and onboard talent in over 150 countries in minutes, or run payroll in over 100 countries with just one click. Offer competitive benefits, equipment, and equity from a single dashboard, even customized career roadmaps, performance assessments, and more for your team through Deal suite of AI-powered learning and development tools. So no matter your global business goals, Deal's team of over 200 legal experts keeps you compliant with local laws every step of the way. So whether you're an enterprise business, a small company, or something in between, Deal is built to meet your unique global HR needs. Ready to transform your global HR? Click the link in the show notes to book a demo with Deal today. That's D-E-E-L.